This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Oh yeah, so over a half century later, we are still here. I'm glad you are too. Happy to have you along for the next 30 minutes. I am Ray D'Alessio. And I am Kenny Bergamy. Sit tight because we got a lot of good stuff for you today. Coming up, nothing like a good watermelon this time of year and picking out the tastiest and best quality melon is easier than you think. Also on the program, John Holcomb on how UGA Extension is playing a major role in helping farmers during the COVID-19 pandemic and using technology to their advantage. Plus, with 4th of July right around the corner, expert foodologist Marsha Crowley is whipping up some tasty ribs that you can serve at your Independence Day bash. All this and more starting right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, you know, nothing says summertime in Georgia quite like slicing into a fresh, juicy watermelon. That's why Damon Jones recently traveled out to Toombs County to get an update on this year's crop and give you some advice on what to look for at the grocery store. With temperatures on the rise, so is the demand for sweet Georgia watermelons. And even though Mother Nature might have thrown a few curveballs late in the growing season, this year's crop appears to be another strong one. So when we started, there weren't quite as many melons ready as should be, but once it started warming up, got a little drier in the middle of May, the bees really got to pollinating and we're starting to see the effects of that now as the melons, we're starting to pull more melons that are ready and the second crop's looking really promising. While that cooler weather might have slowed down the growing process a bit, it did have some positive effects on the crop as well. The growing season has actually been pretty nice. It's, we actually had a spring this year. That cooler weather that was kind of hindering the bees, so it helps the watermelon as far as there wasn't as much pressure with the dry weather, had some good rain, so we weren't having to run the pivots as much. So it's kind of a double-edged sword with the rain and the cooler weather. Hurt you on the pollinating end, but it made everything else uh, do really well. And that's evident in the quality as these fields are covered with ripe watermelons with plenty of size. The quality is really good. This is probably uh, some of the better melons that we've had in the past years. It's right up there with uh, some of the best quality that we've had. The size, our size is looking good because when you're packing melons, depending on which stores they're going to, we're pulling out a lot of 45s, which is really good because that's where most of our melons go to is food line and they want that 45 count. With so many different watermelons to choose from at the grocery store, it's important to know just which one to choose for your family's table. When people go to a store, everybody wants to know, well, how do I know which one's ripe? When you look at the stripes on a watermelon, those lighter, getting a little white and uh, wide on the top of the melon, that means that it's getting ripe. If you flip it over and look at the belly of the watermelon, that more yellow look tint to the bottom, that means you have a, a more red, more riper watermelon. The yellow at the bottom, the riper it's usually going to be. While the ongoing pandemic has negatively affected the demand for a number of different agricultural products, the same can't be said for watermelons. Now there's starting to be more melons ready, which is good because with the 4th of July coming up, everybody would like a melon for the 4th. So it's, uh, the demand, it, it's been better than it has in the past couple years. So we'll see how it finishes out these next couple of weeks before the 4th. And with watermelons being a staple of any 4th of July celebration, Pittman takes great pride in producing the highest quality product. I know a lot of families, when they get ready to celebrate for the 4th, you have to have a watermelon. And I won't like en uh, enjoy knowing that they're getting a quality and a safe product that they can enjoy as a family, celebrate our country, and just kind of really enjoy summer while, you know, they're out of school and everything. And so it's one of the, uh, my favorite crops to grow and I really take pride in knowing that we're putting a quality product out there. Reporting from Toombs County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, no thanks to COVID-19, many businesses and industries have been put on hold. Not the case, though, for agriculture, as farmers and producers throughout the state are working night and day to keep a safe and abundant food supply going, and UGA Extension has played a major role in making that happen, as John Holcomb describes. In March, when the world seemed to stop because of COVID-19, agriculture held its course as farmers worked to get their crops in the ground or take care of what was already sprouting. And right there beside them, UGA Extension, helping farmers by getting any answers they needed and conducting research that will help farmers in future seasons. One of those Extension agents is John McLemore in Coffee County. 
our job is to provide unbiased research-based um, findings on what we do. So if we have growers using things that um, does not provide a yield benefit or it's not helping their crop and it's not paying out um, and they're not getting a good return on their investment, then what is the point of them um, using it? Um, I have a great relationship with my farmers and with my uh, industry people. However, my duty is to be farmers first and just make sure they are well supported and well knowledgeable about the things they're using inside of their crops. In an age of already down prices, the pandemic just adds more stress to the fact that farms often struggle financially, which is why the research they do is so important as it goes from the counties to all over the state to help producers be more profitable. A lot of the way we do the research projects are based upon how farmers do, thing, do things in this county and sometime it, uh, we use it for helping the scientists over in um, Tifton, Georgia, helping them uh, spread the information out throughout the state of Georgia. But field work isn't the only thing they do. Extension also has an educational component in which they hold meetings and learning sessions. And thanks to technology, we're able to keep doing them. We're very traditionally heavy on bringing groups, groups of people together and educating them with bringing specialists in or maybe going out in the field and doing field visits and, and having a field day. So that all came to a halt, literally, and, and I, myself and many, many of my other colleagues across the state, um, you know, what we're talking about, what I did today is, is um, very similar to what many um, agents were doing and still are doing is holding virtual meetings using Zoom. Um, I'm very familiar with Zoom now. Um, before I just used to be a participant and now I know how to record my sessions and share them on YouTube and, and, and never, um, really never had to do that before. Berg says that things went well with the virtual meetings and ended up reaching even more people than they would have in person once they were posted on social media platforms. We have fairly good participation, but uh, really after the fact, um, you know, people could go and watch it anytime they wanted. We would share it on Facebook and, and then I created a YouTube uh, page for, for my work videos specifically. And, and then the views, more views came after the fact. So I think prior to the pandemic, we, we were maybe in a month's time reaching about 10,000 people. And our numbers last month, I think she said were over 44,000 in just a month um, of, of reaching people that are viewing our information. Reporting in Coffee County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. After the break, some important business to take care of, and that's food. Recipes for your 4th of July party menu is next. Hi, I'm Alex Ray. I'm an FIA forester and I've been with GFC for three years. My name is Heather Gregg. I'm a forest inventory and analysis forester and I've been with GFC for 10 months. From day to day, I collect data for the forest inventory and analysis program. We have mapped plots all the way across the state, so we visit these plots and collect data so we can track loss, changes, and growth of forest over time. But when they get the, this data compiled, they distribute it to universities, forest managers, industry, anybody who needs uh, landscape scale information on the forest in our state. Best part of my job is like just getting to see like different parts of the state that you know not a lot of other people are seeing. We cover 26 counties in our area and even if we go to a spot that's similar or even the same spot, the forest is dynamic. It's always changing. We always get to see something different. Top three skills for my job would be like tree ID, um, accurate tree and forest measurements, and technology, you know, like your handheld GPS and your computer. Also, communication skills are a big deal because we deal, most of our plots lie on private land, so we deal with a lot of landowners. One real exciting thing about my job is I, I get to get up and go find a different place in nature like every day. Every day presents just a little bit different goal and every plot has its unique challenges. So even though we have information about where we're supposed to go, it's maybe five years old, maybe it's a couple years old as far as the photos. You don't fully expect what the day's gonna bring. To me, GFC is boots on the ground working for the people and enjoying doing it. I'm Alex Ray, I'm an FIA forester, and I am GFC. 
I'm Heather Gregg, I'm a FIA Forester, and I am GFC. Oh, America the beautiful, land of the free. COVID-19, absolutely no match for meals from the field. No, we just move everything inside to Marsha's kitchen. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, to another edition of Meals from the Field, our third on the road on the edition. Road. I like these. I, we like it as well. You like it because you don't have to don't go have anywhere. To drive. You just wake downtown. up. We're in your kitchen. But <laughs> thank you so much for allowing us oh, into your pleasure. house this month. Last month we were outside your house. This month we're inside your kitchen. Um, beautiful house, by the way. And if you thank hear a you. dog whining, it's Bailey. It's Bailey. Um, Bailey is smelling ribs because that's what we're doing today. We're talking ribs. We're talking out the pies, uh, of course, because Fourth of July is coming up. So reached out to Marsh and I said, let's do something for 4th of July. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And so, it also happens to be peach season. So it just It's peach perfect. season uh, and wait till you see this pie. So tell us what we have, Marsha. All right. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is a uh, peach fruit salad. And I know we've done these before in the past, but this one's a little bit different. Okay. And I'm gonna, I, like always, okay. I've got my mobile GoPro here. And I'm that trying I can get not to shots. get so close. There you go. But it's tough. I'm gonna back up. Okay. This is a cup of Georgia peaches. Mm -hmm. And I've got to find a place to put all these bowls right here. A cup of blueberries, but you, any, it depends on the, how many people you're having. Um, a, a, that would determine how much fruit you have. Okay. This is about a cup and a half of chopped cubed watermelon, which is also from Georgia. Mm -hmm. About a half a cup or a cup of cubed uh, mozzarella cheese. Okay which is kind of weird. For Mozzarella cheese yep. in the watermelon, okay. And this is the really weird, and I was skeptical, really weird ingredient. Is that but bruschetta? It's, so, it's salami. Salami, okay. And this is so good. The, the salami and the watermelon and the peaches all work so well together. You know us Italians, we like salami. Right? I know, I thought of you when I did this. <laughs> and this is a tablespoon of chopped lime, lime, mint. You're gonna stir that up with about two teaspoons, tablespoons of, um, orange juice, just really to keep the fruit from turning, mm -hmm. but it adds some flavor. And this, you make this, a, you know, a couple hours ahead of time, and whenever you take it to your 4th of July picnic or whatever, bring it out and serve it. It's really good, okay. surprisingly good. That's it? That's it. That's quick. That's it for that one. All right, I'm going to put this over here to get it out of our And what's way. our motto on Meals from the Field? We like things quick and easy, right? Uh, you know me, <laughs> if it's got too many ingredients, I don't even look at it. Now the ribs or pie first? Oh, let's do the pie first okay. and save the best for save last. Save the best for last, okay. This is a buttermilk pie. I feel like we've been using buttermilk a lot lately. Okay. I don't know why. All right, this is a cup and a third of sugar. This pie is so easy. A third of a cup of flour and baking powder. This is five and a half tablespoons of melted butter a cup of buttermilk. That is it. By the way, when we get done, do I have to do dishes here in your house? Nah, John. You sure? I'll okay. make Jim do them. We'll make John do it. Yeah, we'll make John. John, John we'll make Hawkins John back Jim. there behind the camera. We'll make John do it. You're going to bake this, pour it, pour it in a deep dish pie plate. Of okay. course, make sure it's a deep dish or it's going to run over. And bake this for about 35, 45 minutes at 350, depending on your oven. And it, this is so good. It's not super sweet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can put fruit on top. Of course, we put peaches on top, nice. as you saw earlier. And you can bake that, like I said. All right, let's move this out of the way. There we see All right, the here finished we go. product in the pie. We're looking at it now. Look at how delicious that thing is. Okay, so okay. now we save the best said, for we last. Save the best for last. Okay. Ribs. These are um, baby back ribs, but you could use whatever kind of ribs you like. Come on, do it. Do it. Come on, baby. No, Come on. I'm not oh, going to do that. Don't disappoint me. The, I guess these, you bake these in the oven. They're called um, oven baked fall off the bone okay. ribs. And the key to them falling off the bone and cooking evenly is I don't know if you can see, I made a little slit between the bones there. there. And that will allow all this stuff to go in there. 
So what you're going to do j basically just to the ribs is you're going to sprinkle liberally salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder mm -hmm. on both sides. That's all you do to the ribs. Then you're going to cover these very, very tightly and you're going to bake them for two and a half to three hours okay. at 275 and they are really good. We'll move that right there. All right, then that last thing is the barbecue sauce with peaches. Nice. And this barbecue sauce, I was kind of leery of it a little bit, so I didn't put it on the ribs until I tasted the sauce, but it's really good. That's good, huh? Yep, it's good. All right, this is a cup, a half a cup of ketchup and cider vinegar. And you're gonna put this, put it on low. I've got a sauteed onion in the pan. This is two to three tablespoons of brown sugar, depending on how sweet you like it. Mm -hmm. A tablespoon of hot sauce. This is sriracha, which is a little sweeter than the ba mm -hmm. basic Tabasco sauce. Two tablespoons was too much for me. It wasn't for others, so I did one. Okay. Since I'm cooking, I can do what yeah, I want, right? It's your kitchen. It's my kitchen. Well, I mean, literally, it's her kitchen. My kitchen. So. And this is a cup of Georgia peaches chopped, and you're just going to... Cook this until it starts to simmer and put it on the ribs when they come out or on the side, or you could use your favorite prepared store bought barbecue sauce. Peaches Either one's fine. And ribs on top They're of ribs. They're so good, but they're, oh, it's so good. I'm not going to argue it's with so, you. No, it's good. You're going to get to try it later. And, and that, that's it. And that is it. And of course, uh, like we always say, folks, we like to make things very, very simple for you. So uh, you can make all these recipes yourself by logging on to farm-monitor.com. Uh, again, the list of recipes just continues to grow and grow yeah, uh, every single time. Uh, we try not to repeat recipes if we can. Um, so thank you for that well, creative genius mind that you got going up You're there. pushing it now. <laughs> so, Marsha, again, we cannot thank you for allowing thank us into your house. As I said, you have a beautiful home. Thank you. Um, hopefully we can do this next month. Here. Who knows? Probably the way things are going. But folks, thank you for watching. Again, farm-monitor.com. Check out the recipe section uh, and, and just uh, enjoy your 4th of July and have a safe and happy one. Enjoy. We will see you next month. Kenny, we will send it back to you in the studio. Ray and Marsha, thanks so much. Up next, maintaining a quality environment while at the same time cutting costs? Unheard of when it comes to chicken houses, right? Wrong. We'll show you what researchers at UGA have discovered. Well, finally this week, with more than 25 million pounds of chicken produced each day here in Georgia, it's essential for growers to maintain the most efficient houses possible without sacrificing any quality. And thanks to new technology being tested by the University of Georgia, farmers can now have the best of both worlds. Damon Jones has the story. Walk through any grocery store and you'll likely find a plentiful supply of both chicken 
and eggs. However, the production cost to keep these shelves constantly stocked has steadily been on the rise with the increased cost of electricity. It's why researchers at the University of Georgia are experimenting with new technology in order to help the farmer's bottom line. Everybody's interested in energy conservation, but when you're talking about those two type of farms, there's not a whole lot of things that you can do once you change out the lights. And so we had an opportunity to test some new fans that are variable speed fan technology. You know, look to see exactly what the power savings and opportunities they are there for energy conservation. And so far so good as early results have shown a dramatic reduction in power usage. The cost, for instance, of operating the tunnel ventilation fans or the sidewall fans for an entire year is around $2,000. And what we've learned with variable speed fans, we can cut that roughly in half to $1,000. So on this two house farm, we're looking at potentially reducing his fan operating costs by $2,000 a year. And the reason for that is these fans are able to change speeds based on the situation instead of constantly running at full speed. If you slow a fan down 10%, it moves 10% less air, but it uses 30% less power. So all we're doing is we're slowing down a fan that moves a lot of air down to what maybe half or maybe a third of what it normally does. It still is moving the air. We're still uh, providing the great environment for the birds. We're monitoring that, but we're dramatically reducing our power usage. Not only are they more efficient, these fans are also much quieter and easier to maintain. But as the old saying goes, you get what you pay for. It is very expensive, but over time, um, we're going to see these prices come down. So right now it's uh, the sort of that uh, early adopter type of situation on the fans. But you see within probably 10 years, I think this is going to be common technology. A much easier and less expensive way to lower your power bill is to install LED lights. It will improve the light distribution within the house while also conserving power for a very reasonable cost. The lighting system, which is high pressure sodium lighting, was using as much power as the fans were. So we thought, how can we reduce that as well? So we installed an LED lighting system, which cut the lighting system operating costs roughly in half. We're saving $1,000 a year. It costs roughly materials $2,000 to install the system. So we're looking at a two-year payback period without any type of assistance from government programs. So that is one of those things we tell people, go ahead, do it. So between the state-of-the-art lighting and ventilation system, it's clear that poultry houses will be running more efficiently than ever. So we're really, looking at a situation here where we're going to be using less power on this farm now than when it was built, you know, 20 years ago. Reporting from Royston, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Good job, Damon. Thanks so much. And thank you for making the show possible. Before we send you on your way, a friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia farms, be sure you check out all our social media platforms. You'll stay informed to see what's up in the world of farming and with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Stay safe.